Good evening, guys. Thank you for coming out. Um, I'm glad to see Pastor Ben here. He asked me on uh, Sunday morning if I was ready to preach. I told him no. <laughs> so, Sunday afternoon, he emailed me a sermon. Said, just go ahead and preach this. So, <laughs> it, if you don't like it, he's right there. Let him know after, after the service. He's always here to help. He just told me that before I walked up here tonight. Always here to help. So, um, and, and then I would like to, I'd like to thank my wife, Brenda, before I get started. She was, you know, a lot of help today on the way to church tonight. I, I had to open up to her and confess something to her, and she helped me out a lot. Yeah, I, I told her, I said, you know, one thing, the, the main thing I don't like about preaching is I feel like everybody's looking at me. <laughs> and she told me they are. <laughs> so then I kind of got quiet, and I was driving here the rest of the way, and then my mind started going. Well, if all you guys are doing is looking at me, and all I'm doing is looking at you, is this going to turn out to be a staring contest? <laughs> Anyways, thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to be here. I appreciate it. It's a, it's a big honor. Um, if I could have you guys uh, take your Bibles, open it to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah, chapter 1. But I'm still old school. I use notes. I don't have a handy-dandy iPad and stuff like that so <laughs> it is there you go so I'd just like to start out tonight with a question question is why do we run why do we run from God I've titled my message tonight running away so why do we run from the Lord Jonah ran away I have run away, and I'm sure all of you have run away. But why do we run? This is a Thursday night crowd, and you guys here are truly the faithful. As you know, most of the people that show up on a Sunday morning don't show up Thursday night. So tonight I'm going to focus on the Christian and why the Christian runs away. We know why the lost people run away. Why the lost souls run. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. How many times do you pray and it feels like your prayers are going nowhere? They hit the ceiling, and that's it. You know, when you've been saved long enough that sometimes it feels like your prayers are not going anywhere, and you get that empty feeling in your gut that says it's not right. I'm not being heard by God. You know you're not right with God, and you can tell that your prayers are not making it past the ceiling. Then you start to think back over the last few days, and maybe even over the last few months, and you start to realize that it seems like everything's been fa going fairly good in your life. But now you're having some problems. And now you want to talk to God. But it feels like there's a busy signal every time you dial up to God. And you're starting to realize that maybe you've been slipping in your walk with God. Maybe you've been running from God. In Psalms 66, verse 18, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. What you need to realize is, is that sin is always the reason that you're slipping away from God. It may be the sin of omission or the sin of co commission. The sin of omission is not doing something or failing to do something the Bible teaches us to do. 
The sin of omission is a failure of duty to the word of God. Or we could be committing the sin of commission. A sin of commission involves us doing something we know to run deliberately contrary to what Scripture commands us. So you must understand that sin is where it all starts. Sin is the beginning of running away. When I look throughout the Bible, I see many many accounts where people have run away from God for various reasons. One of my favorite accounts in the Bible is Jonah. I love the book of Jonah. I see a lot of myself in Jonah. Not because Jonah was so tall and handsome and smart. Not because he was so happy and such a likable guy as myself. But I love the book of Jonah because he was so real. God threw out all of Jonah's faults in the book of Jonah. Jonah was a rebel. Jonah hated people. Jonah was very hard-headed, and Jonah thought he was very smart. He even thought he was so smart that he could outsmart God. And he could tell God what to do. Now, looking through the Bible, I guess maybe Peter in the New Testament had followed Jonah in his footsteps because Peter couldn't seem to keep his foot out of his mouth either. That's one definite proof that the Bible is not just a book that man made, but that it is God-breathed. Because if man would have written the Bible without the inspiration of God, then Jonah would be one book in the Bible that would not be what it is. We as humans tend to have a bend towards ourselves to make us look a little bit better than we are. We tend to try to change it a little bit, just so that way other people look worse than we do. We can try to make ourselves look a little bad, but we always have that bend to make us look better. Jonah is truly one account in the Bible that leaves us so much to think about. I love when I'm studying the Bible, kind of like Pastor does, I love to imagine things. And the book of Jonah, in my in my opinion, the book of Jonah leaves so much to the imagination. So many things you could imagine how it was back then, how Jonah was back then, how the world was back then. It just, it just leaves so much to imagine. One thing I like to imagine is we know Jonah was rich. So I just wonder, what did Jonah's house look like? What kind of car did Jonah drive? Or was it a cart? I mean, it it just, rich back then and rich now are two different things, and it just makes me wonder, what kind of street did he live on? What did his house look like? What did his yard look like? Just things like that. That's one thing I, one reason I like the book of Jonah. So let's take a look into Jonah and see if we can glean anything from his life about running away. In Jonah verse one, or chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amite, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried, Every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us, that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots, 
that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray, tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto them, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was temptuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land. But they could not, for the sea wrought and was temptuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. Let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for allowing me to use this pulpit tonight. And I just pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would use me in a mighty way. That you would fill me with the Holy Spirit and use me to only preach what you want me to preach. And to say what you want me to say. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would start using the Holy Spirit right now to convict anybody that's in this room that may not be saved. And I just pray that you would just use the convicting power of the Holy Spirit to bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ tonight before they leave this room. And I just pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you wouldn't allow any of us that has walked in here tonight to walk out of here the same way we walked in. And I just thank you, Jesus, for everything that you do. And I pray in Jesus' name. And Elmwood Baptist said, uh, The kids do it better. So I'd like to start off by pointing out the book of Jonah and the account of what took place with Jonah has absolutely nothing to do with the fish. I believe we put too much emphasis on the fish. The fish is just a prop in this account in the Bible. The fish is just a tool God used. The fish is so unimportant in this book that God does not even allow us to know what kind of fish it was. Was it a well? Or was it a guppy? Now you may be saying, wait, what about Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, that says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so sh shall the Son of Man be there three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So you may be saying, that's Jesus speaking. So are you saying that Jesus is a liar? No. It's the word well that's translated for us. The original word is dayweg in Hebrew, which means in the sense of a squirming or moving by the vib vibratory action of the tail. When it was translated in Matthew, they translated it into the Greek word ketos which means a huge sea monster or a huge sea creature or a well. But if you dig deeper, you find out that in Latin, the word ketos is cetus. And in Latin, the word cetesin, which is a derivative of cetus, which means well. Which means that the translators were using a word when changed a little bit to seatesin from the original Latin word cetus does mean well. But we're not using a derivative of a word. We're using the words in its Hebrew and Greek meaning, 
not the Latin meaning, which is called a great fish. So that's all a little bit of Bible college language, probably just a little bit over everybody's head. I got a little confused when I started looking into it. So let's just, let's just agree that it means an aquatic creature or a big or mighty or long or noble sea creature. So as long as we can agree on that, then we're good. So a lot of people say that it had to be a great big fish, big enough to swallow a man. They say, to, they say it would have to be a mighty fish. If you guys look up on the internet, you'll find tons of stuff about the fish and what people think of, of the fish and that it had to be a well and the size of the fish. And I mean, it's all over what people are saying it had to be. But the Bible specifically says it was an aquatic sea creature. So, God can do anything. God could make a guppy swallow Jonah if he wanted to. If you saw a guppy swallowing a man whole, wouldn't you agree that was a great, mighty fish? <laughs> but none of that really matters anyways, because this is a book about God and a prophet of God that is not following Jesus. He's not listening. He's running away. And God is going to use this fish as a way to bring him back. A lot of people, including a lot of Christians, believe that the account of Jonah is just a story and did not really happen. We have proof that Jonah was a real person, that he was not made up as a fable. Let's everybody turn your Bibles over to 2 Kings chapter 14. In 2 Kings chapter 14, starting in verse 23, the Bible says, In the fifteenth year of Amazi, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and reigned forty and one years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord, God of Israel, what he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amity, the prophet, which was of Gath Hepper. Jeroboam was a real person. Israel was a real nation. Hamath was a real place. And it's quite unlikely that this man Jonah is a figment of our imagination. This is a historical record, and it is reasonable to conclude that Jonah is also a historical character. All these people and places were real. And then it talks about Jonah. Why would all this real stuff be talked about and then the Bible would just throw in a mythical creature? As the late great Dr. McGee put it, it is begging the point to say that this is another Jonah. It is not reasonable to believe that there were two Jonas whose fathers were named Amidi and who were, who were both prophets. This is especially evident when it is observed that the name of Jonah was not a common name. After all, Jonah is not like our American surname of Jones. The only time that the name occurs in the Bible are in the reference in 2 Kings, in the book of Jonah itself, and in the New Testament reference to that book. There's only one Jonah in the Bible, and he is a historical person. So let's look at the, a little history of Jonah. The book of Jonah was written in the 8th century before Christ by Jonah. The book for its size records more miracles than any other biblical book. No less than 8 in 48 verses. Averaging one miracle per each 6 verses. Note, miracle 1, the wind. 
Miracle 2, the calm. Miracle 3, the sea creature. Miracle 4, the survival in the sea creature. Miracle 5, the release from the sea creature. Miracle 6, the gourd. Miracle 7, the worm. And Miracle 8, the east wind. The book of Jonah vividly demonstrate, demonstrates that out of all God's vast and marvel, marvelously created universe, the only speck of matter that can say no to his creator is man. The wind obeyed him. The ocean obeyed him. The fish obeyed him. The gourd obeyed him. The worm obeyed him. And then you have Jonah who disobeyed him. God sent Jonah to Nineveh to preach to 600,000 Ninevites. Jonah is the first missionary called and sent. This book also shows God's foreign mission program was in existence centuries prior to the Great Commission of Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. The Bible states, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all, three, all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. God has always wanted us to witness. Jonah means dove. He was an Israelite. He was the son of a mighty. We do not know much about his father. But in the Brown Diver Briggs Dictionary, the name of mighty means my truth. Jonah was from Gath Heifer, a place in Palestine, and God put four things in Jonah's path to teach Jonah a lesson. A storm, a fish, a gourd, a worm. Jonah had a lot to learn, and he was not going down quietly. Which brings me to my first point. <laughs> point number one. Jonah was on a trip going down. Notice that God says in his word that Jonah went down three times. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 3, you guys can turn back over to the book of Jonah. We're going to be there um, the rest of the night. But in Jonah chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible says, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. In Jonah chapter 1 verse 5, the Bible says, The mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. What we need to realize is that when we're running from the Lord, we're always on a trip down. Oh, I believe Jonah thought he had it made in verse 3. The Bible states that he rose up. Yes, I believe he did rise up. That's exactly what happens when we run from God. We rise up thinking more highly of ourselves than we should. I'm sure that Jonah thought he had it made, that he had his bags packed. I imagine that he had on his Hawaiian shirt, he had on his swimming trunks, he had on an oversized straw hat he, that was probably shadowing his face so no one could really see who he was. He had his camera packed, he had his cell phone, and his charger, he had his iPad, and it was all updated and packed. He was going to sit along the, bent, the beach and watch the latest YouTube downloads of the Elmwood Baptist Church service. Maybe he was even going to catch up on some of Pastor Coomer's YouTube downloads. So just in case he started arguing with Mrs. Jonah on his trip, he'd know how to stop, think, pray, and turn it over to God at the point of impact. Catch up on Dr. Coomer's YouTube video. She would know what I'm talking about. So when Mrs. Jonah wanted to buy a whole new wardrobe after Jonah had just spent most of his money over there on their over-extravagant wedding, he would know how to treat her. 
Oh yes, Jonah was definitely rising up, but only in his mind. So as you can see, Jonah was running away. And Jonah had his, prayer, his prayers hindered. Maybe, just thinking, maybe one reason Jonah may have been running away and may have had his prayer hindered is maybe he was fighting with Mrs. Jonah through all of this over how much money she was planning to spend in Tarsus. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto, unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Brenda and I are not always perfect in how we treat each other, but we do know what the Bible says, and we're always working to live by it, even though oftentimes we fail, and we fail at it miserably sometimes. Take, for instance, Ephesians 4.26. The Bible says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Brenda and I take this verse very seriously. This is probably one of the main reasons we've been married for over 18 years. We promised each other that we would never go to bed angry at each other. That's why, as of tonight, we've been going on four days without any sleep. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So I have faith that Brenda will get right very soon. <laughs> so maybe Jonah could learn a little bit from us on how to have God hear his prayers. Jonah did not realize at the time that he could not run from God. God had a plan for his life, and he was going to make sure Jonah obeyed him. So God sent a great wind. He was sending him a storm in his life in more ways than just one. We will always face storms in our lives if we choose to run from God. God is using this storm to turn Jonah around and to put him on the right track. As you can see at this point, Jonah is so far from God that he has quenched any, quenched any conviction from God, and he is so far away that he is not even listening to God. He's so far from God that he can actually sleep during the storm. The storm that is so severe, even the mariners or the sailors that were accustomed to storms, the ones that lived their lives on the sea, they knew this was a supernatural storm. They woke up Jonah and started asking why he has done this to them. They knew something is going on with him. At this point, the sailors, they're pagan, and they do not believe in the one true God. They do not know much about him either. Notice, even in the face of death, Jonah does not tell them about God. He does not witness to them. He just says he is a Hebrew that fears the God of heaven. These sailors are more worried about saving his life than he is worried about them. He says, oh, just throw me overboard. And these pagan men try everything they can not to do that to Jonah. They think if they do that, he will surely die out there. Throwing him overboard is not the answer in their mind. So these pagan men start throwing overboard all their stuff trying to save Jonah. God sent out a great tempest to get Jonah to bring him back. The word tempest means hurricane, storm, whirlwind. If you notice, Jonah did not jump overboard. Oh no, he told them, you guys throw me overboard. Maybe he thought that it was only a regular storm. And if he made it take longer, then the storm would stop. Maybe he thought because the mariners tried to lighten up the ship to save everyone, that if, if, they, if he told them to throw him overboard and they refused, that God would stop the storm and he would just keep going on his merry way. The mariners who do not know God as the only one true God still knew of him like all creation does. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible states, For in the invisible things of, of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even of his eternal power and Godhead, 
so that they are without excuse. If you noticed, they prayed to God that Jonah's blood would not be on their hands. They knew enough about God to know what he required. But God is going to make sure Jonah learns his lesson. So the storm doesn't stop. And eventually, they do throw Jonah overboard. And here enters the fish. Which brings me to my second point. Point number two. Even when we're running, God is still there. Turn your Bibles over to Jonah chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the sea, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again towards the holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depths closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head, about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought me up, brought up my life from corruption. O Lord my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayers came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Jonah was now smack in the middle of his storm. He was stuck inside the belly of the fish. Just imagine what that had to have been like. Just imagine getting swallowed by a fish. A big fish, a well, whatever it is. Imagine the smell, the, the dead fish that are inside of there. Imagine the seaweeds wrapped around his head. Imagine just how awful it could be in there. Now, I have a picture in my mind of Jonah in the, the, the fish's belly. I don't know why I have this picture. I don't know how he ever got there. But in my mind, when I think about Jonah in the fish's belly, I think somehow he got a chair in there, and he's sitting on the chair, and he's like, what have I done? And somehow he got some wood in there, and he's able to get some rocks piled up, and he's got some wood on top of the rocks. Don't ask me how this happened, because how the wood didn't get wet, I don't know. But he's like MacGyver. Somehow he found a way to light this wood. So he's sitting on a chair in the fish's belly with a fire going, and he's thinking, what do I do now? God's not listening to me. What do I do now? I've got to figure out a way to get out of here. And then God puts the fire out. And he's in complete darkness. And I, I imagine that's when Jonah decided he was going to turn. And that's when Jonah decided that he was going to start praying to God. So Jonah prays. He's no longer thinking of how smart he is or how he's going to do it on his own. All he can think about is how he needs help, and there's only one place to get help from, and that is God. God is right there. He's listening to Jonah. He's never left him. How many times do we put ourselves in a position that as a child of God, we have to put, be put in the fish's belly to get a little fish guts all over us, to get us all stinky and slimy and alone in the dark before we remember God and before we choose to bring God into our lives. And the whole time, God is sitting there waiting for us. He's not wanting us to clean up before we come to Him. Come to him. He doesn't care how we come as long as we come to him. And as Jonah prayed, God heard and said, Fish, spit him out. And up came Jonah. Which brings me to my third point. Point number three. God is the God of second chances. Turn over to Jonah chapter three. We are getting a lot of Bible here tonight, huh? Amen. 
Amen. We can't have enough Bible. Jonah chapter 3, verse number 1 and following. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on a sackcloth for the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and set in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the kings and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let every man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Notice here, God calls Jonah a second time. God is always ready to take you back when you're running away. If you're willing, the world will not give you a second chance like God just gave Jonah a second chance. Just imagine for a minute if this type of thing happened in the world. Say your boss tells you to pack up and and he tells you you're going on a business trip to Wyoming. Woohoo, Wyoming! No? I, when I was imagining this, I couldn't think of a better state to go visit. But anyway, imagine. He tells you you're going to a business trip to Wyoming, and you can use the company car. All things are paid for. The room, the board, the gas, the food, etc. Oh, and by the way, you also have the company credit card and access to the company bank account, where all the money is, And all you need to do is to go to Wyoming and tell the rest of the company the keys to being successful in that business. But no, you're not going to Wyoming because you don't like Wyoming. You think everyone in Wyoming is lazy and mean and they smell bad like cows. So you decide that you're not going to Wyoming. So you take off to Hawaii instead and you live it up there until all the money's gone. Then you come back. Do you think if that was to happen, that your boss would just let you come back with open arms? No, absolutely not. You're done. You're fired. You're sitting in prison. And you won't be called back in three days like Jonah was. You're done for. I guarantee there is no second chance like that in this world. But that's exactly what God did. He called Jonah back. He gave him a second chance. God has given many people second second chances. He gave the prodigal son a second chance. Remember the story of Jacob way back in the book of Genesis. Jacob failed again and again and again and again until he actually became a disgrace to God and a source of embarrassment to himself. But God never let him go. Then there's the story of David. David committed an awful sin, but God punished him for it. But God forgave David when he came to him and said, Restore unto me thy joy, the joy of thy salvation. Simon Peter also stumbled and fell and got himself dirty. He denied Christ. Then there's John Mark. He wasn't much of a missionary at first. In fact, he was a chicken. He turned and went home. As you see now, Jonah goes into Nineveh and does what God tells him to do. He preaches to them, and then they repent. Remember, it's not our job to win anyone to Christ. That's God's job. All we're commanded to do is to go out and witness, to tell people 
how to get saved. Some plant, some water, and some harvest. But no matter what our job is, it's always God's job to save the lost. We can't save them anyways. So that's why God sent us out to witness. And this is exactly what happened here with Jonah. Jonah obeyed, and the Ninevites repented. Just exactly what Jonah did not want to happen. Which brings me to my last point. Point number four. God is always gracious when dealing with his children. Turn over to Jonah chapter four. We're still going, guys. We're still going with the Bible. Jonah chapter 4, verse number 1 says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying, when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil? Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city, and sat on the east side of the city, and there made he a booth, and sat under it in the shadow, till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd, but God prepared a worm. When the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd, that it withered. And it came to pass, when the sun did arise, that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted, and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonas, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then, the, then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored. Neither madest it grow, which came up in a night, and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, the great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? Jonah is very angry at this point, because Nineveh turned to God. The last time the book of Jonah shows Jonah praying, he was inside the fish. The next time, he is outside of Nineveh. That is why he is so disobedient. He's not walking with God. Jonah's running from God. Jonah has hatred and bitterness in his heart for the Ninevites. Jonah did not want the Ninevites saved. He did not think they deserved it. He hated them, and he knew that the God of the Bible, he knew God was gracious, and he knew if he did what God told him to do, that there was a chance the Ninevites would repent, and God would graciously save them which is exactly what happened. Jonah thought the Ninevites couldn't be trusted. He thought that if God did not destroy them and save them, instead, that they would turn back to their old wicked way. He feels like he's doing God a favor, stopping him from making a mistake. So he doesn't have to tell God, see, I told you so. Jonah was looking at their outward parts. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, the Bible says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I, re I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. J. Vernon McGee put it this way, Now I think you'll agree that Jonah has really been through the mill. In fact, he's been through a fish. He's had quite an experience. Then he came into the city of Nineveh. He gave out God's word faithfully, and the city turned to God. This man is now overwrought, overstimulated. He's exhausted, absolutely drained, and he wants to die. 
Many of us reach this stage sometimes. We can get to the place where we feel like saying, this is it. I give up. I quit. I don't want to go any further. We're tired. We're exhausted. Just like Jonah was. Jonah's very angry with God right now. Notice how God asked him a question and Jonah didn't even answer him. In Jonah chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says, Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? In verse 5 it says, So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow, till he might see what would become of the city. That is what happens when you're running away from God. You end up getting mad at God, and then you stop talking to him, just like Jonah. So Jonah went out of the city, set on the east side of the city. The east side of the city was up in the hill country, up at an elevation, that Jonah got himself a good spot where he could look at over the city. Because he didn't trust the Ninevites. He thought they would go right back into their sinning. And if they did, he knew God would destroy them. Because God never changes. Jonah wanted to be up there if the fire started falling. That's the kind of man we're dealing with here. And he's the man who had brought God's message. If that's not proof that God can use anyone, I don't know what is. Jonah's up there sitting on his little hillside, and he's filled with bitterness and hatred. He's all alone. He has no friends. He wants no friends. And he's still running from God. Now God's going to try to reach Jonah. He's going to try to get him to see it his way. In Jonah chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible says, And the Lord God prepared a gourd, and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. God's going to try to let Jonah get attached to this gourd, to love this gourd, to take care of this gourd. We can all get attached to things that are not human. Take, for instance, dogs. Many people have dogs, and they love their dogs, like they're their own children. We even have names for that now. They're called our fur babies, or we're pet parents. Brenda and myself have three dogs, and I know Brenda loves them to death. I'm convinced that she loves them more than she loves me. They definitely get more kisses than I do. And I can't remember the last time I got tucked in at night. I, I, maybe we need some counseling after. Maybe. But anyways, God's going to use this non-human thing with Jonah to try to reason with him. I believe Jonah loved this gourd. He took care of it, probably watered it, sang to it, I imagine maybe even used miracle grow on it. It was his. It was his gourd. Gore. He probably, in my imagination, had a name for it. I'm guessing he called it Gordo. <laughs> he loved this gourd. I don't know if any of you have ever had a gourd. I've never had a gourd. I'm not even quite sure what a gourd looked like. But Jonah loved this gourd. So maybe that should be the next big thing. Maybe we should all go out and get a gourd. Because God is using this gourd, or gordo as I like to say, to try to change Jonah. In Jonah chapter 4 verse 7, But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise, that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah. Then he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Now the withering of his beloved, beautiful little Gordo was his tipping point for Jonah. He survived the storm on the boat. He handled getting thrown overboard into the sea. He didn't give up though, even though he was swallowed by a great fish. 
He was willing to walk into the enemy city of Nineveh and proclaim God's message. All these things he coped with, but his dying gourd leading to the sun beating down on him, that was just too much for Jonah. Jonah tells God, I want to die. He says, take my life. Really? Are these things that bad? Is a gourd that great? That's why I want to get a gourd. I, I, I just don't get it. In Jonah chapter 4, verse 9, it says, And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for, for the which thou hast not labored. Neither made us grow, which came up in a night, and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, the great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? God's now going to move on this man Jonah. He's going to deal with him personally. We're going to have an answer here to the question that's often asked. Do you have to love people before you can bring the word of God to them? Do you have to love people before you can go out and witness to them? Do you have to love these people before you're a missionary to them? Jonah may be a good example of this particular question. For one thing is for sure, Jonah didn't love the Ninevites. God said to Jonah, Jonah, a gourd is nothing, my friend. I hate to say this, but a little gourd is nothing. But a human being has a soul that is either going to heaven or hell. And God didn't ask us to go out and love the lost before we witness to him. Just like he didn't say that to Jonah. He said, I love the lost. And I want you to go to them. And that's exactly what he said to Jonah. He told Jonah, I love the, the Ninevites. And that made me think, this may be a little bit weird to you guys, what, what, why are you sitting up here from the pulpit saying that God isn't saying you have to love the lost to witness to them? How many of you guys love people you don't know? You don't know most of these people you're going to witness to. So if you're basing your emotions and how you feel about going out and witnessing to somebody, you're on the whole wrong, you're doing it wrong. We can't love people that we don't know. We need to obey God's command. God loves them. God has called us to go out to witness because God loves them. And the more we get to know these people, we will learn to love these people. We've got a witness, no matter how we feel inside, like Jonah hated these people, we've got a witness because we love the Lord. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. So just, just think about that. So, this is the end of the story of Jonah. Now, nothing else is said about what happened with Jonah. But I think after this, after God explained to him that he loved the Ninevites, and that he loved Jonah, and that if he would just get to know the Ninevites, and how they had changed, he would love to learn them too. I believe then Jonah realized that he had been wrong this whole time. He ended up seeing everything God's way, and he stopped running from God. And he turned and repented. I believe that Jonah went down into Nineveh and got to know them, and he ended up loving them. And he probably ended up taking Miss Jonah and their 12 kids on vacation every year to Nineveh, just so he could remind them what God did and what God can do with anyone who's running from him and decides to come back. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, 
the Bible states, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's bow our heads tonight. And as we bow our heads tonight,